text for our message this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. Now, as Americans, we have long struggled with this parable. And I'm not just talking about in modern history. I'm not talking about today, but even back to the foundation of our country. See, the English preachers, or also Anglican preachers as they would have been known, well, they would say, use this parable to say that the Puritans who had moved over to the U.S., well, that they had been cast out of the land. Because as you may or may not know from history, they did have to leave the land because of their difference of beliefs. Well, they would say that they had been cast out, and they were that unmerciful servant, the wretches who had been cast into the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, we don't necessarily struggle with that anymore. Maybe a little, a little later in our history, we use this to defend ourselves as a country. Now, we are all proud Americans, right? We celebrated Veterans Day this week, and we we're proud of our soldiers. Well, there was a several preachers. There was a movement called the Revivalist Movement early on in our history. You may have heard of these revival preachers before. You may have seen TV shows or things like that where they have the big tents. They set them up, and they go out in the middle of nowhere, and they call up everybody. And, well, early in our history, they, revivalist preachers would use this parable to say, this is about stewardship. And as we live in the greatest country in the world, we have been blessed. We have been given more, and they would drum up the support. They would get people off their chairs, out of their pews, jumping up and down for the Lord. And, well, it got to such a point that there was an author by the name of Sinclair Lewis who actually wrote a satire about these preachers. He, uh, his main character was a guy by the name of uh, Elmer Gantry. Gantry was a womanizing alcoholic who somehow managed to get ordained as a Baptist preacher. You can see a bit of the satire already, but he continued throughout that book to basically saying, this is not what this parable is about. And, and we say the same thing right now. That is not what this parable is about. It's not about stewardship. It's not about how much we have to give, the time, the talents, or the treasures. Now, it would be easy as Americans to jump on that because we live in a very consumeristic society, don't we? A lot of people ask that question. What's it worth to you? Has anybody ever asked that question? Well, what's it worth to you? What is that value? Well, that's again, it's not even about America, to be honest with you. In fact, we know what this is about. Because if we look at the rest of Matthew 25, we see Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and how it is going to be on the last day. And if we look back at our text, well, let's talk about Zephaniah. Zephaniah, did you see that word he used? Wailing. Pretty scary terms, isn't it? Talking about the last day, that kingdom of God, talking about the day of the Lord, as Zephaniah put it, scary stuff, wailing. He used lots of war language, didn't he? Did you see, if you look back at your text, you see that uh, over and over again he talked about how difficult it will be. And, well, Paul wasn't too much better in Thessalonians, was he? He said that it will come upon us like a woman's labor pain. Now, I have not been pregnant. I don't think that it's avail uh, optional yet. But what I understand is that first contraction, that first labor pain, it nearly doubles over the woman. Because not only does it catch her by surprise, but it is a severe pain. Now, is that the way we want to describe the day of the Lord? It seems like a scary, painful, we might even go so far as to say horrific day. But what if, what if we said that that wasn't the most horrific thing from our text today? In fact, it's not, is it? Because to find the most horrific part of our text today, we actually do have to go to that parable of the talents. We have to go right to the very end of that parable, and we see that the punishment for that one, that one last servant. It was eternal punishment, wasn't it? And that is more horrific than any of the things in our text for today. It's more horrific than the things happening in our world today. And it's so horrific, not so much because of the punishment. That in and itself would be more than enough. But just read further and you see that what they're missing out on. They are missing out on the generosity of a loving God. They are missing, he is missing out on the fact that God himself, that he gave he gave all he had. Did you see that right at the beginning, verse 14? He gave all he had to his people. And we're not talking a small amount either. When we talk about five talents, keep in mind one talent, by conservative estimate, was about 20 years worth of work. 
20 years, so 20 times 5, 100 years worth of work. And so even the smallest amount, he gave them that much, that much income. Our God is a generous God. He is a loving God. But he's also sometimes a misunderstood God, isn't he? He's a misunderstood master. Because many times, people, instead of seeing him as that loving and generous God, that loving God who came to us, who gave, his, who gave everything for us in his son, they, they, they have a, this view of him that either is from their perceptions, from their imagination. And I don't know that I need to even list, list, the, list, the, name, the, list the different ways people have viewed God. Because uh, all of you have heard. Most of you probably have friends who are non-Christian friends, or even if, if not, you've turned on your televisions, you've heard what people say about God. That He's brutal. That the God of the Old Testament, that He's mean. That He's petty. He even calls Himself jealous. Or as the servant called Him, a hard man. Reaping where He did not sow. Gathering where He scattered no seed. That view of God, it does a couple of things. When we view God, we're not viewing Him in, as the God of Scripture, are we? We're not seeing Him as the true God. But we're seeing Him as a wrathful God. A God who paralyzes us in fear. Or you have the other extreme. You have the other extreme in our country today. of That view of God. And even some... Sometimes even in the Christian church. That old grandfatherly type God. He's strong enough to love us. But he's not strong enough to challenge us. To discipline us. He preaches a message of tolerance and acceptance. Oh, this is the, the God who, who makes sure everything's okay. That when we stand before him, it will be, well, you are very tolerant. You are very kind. But is that the God of Scripture? It doesn't sound like the God who said, there is only one way to be saved, does it? It doesn't sound at all who, uh, like the God who said, there is only one truth. And my law, I expect perfection. It doesn't sound like that God, the God of Scripture, does it? Even Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But we live in a world, and not just in our world, but even in our churches, at times where we want a God who, who kind of is that grandfatherly type, don't we? Because it makes us more comfortable. It's easier to deal with a God like that because, well, if we have a God like that, then it doesn't matter if we do wrong. It doesn't matter if we, if we keep his law perfectly. We can shrug it off and say, well, no one is good enough pat ourselves on the back and said, well, that was a good day, right? But that is not who our God is. That is not who our Master is. Our Master, He demands perfection. He demanded perfection. And there was only one payment for that perfection. It wasn't a brutal, ugly, rough way through the crucifixion of His own Son on the cross. Through the One who lived the perfect life. The One who went through each day, never sinning, never breaking His law, but being led, beaten and bruised, to hang on the cross for our sins. That, was the, that is our God. He gave everything for us. He gave out of His generosity. He poured out His heart before us through His own Son. For the, th for the sins that we could not pay for. For the crimes that we could not atone for. Christ gave His blood. He died on the cross. He bled to pay the price for us. And that was all that it took. That was the only thing that needed to be paid. There was nothing more we needed to do, nothing more that we could do. Because in that moment, He paid everything. Now sometimes we do, we get caught up in those talents. We get caught up in looking at it and say, wait a minute though, He gave five to some and two to the other and one to the third. 
what does that mean? And we look at that and we say, well, see, God, He gives to different people in different ways. But the thing is, every bit that He gives us is from the generosity of His heart. It's not meant as something to say, well, you're better than another. You're more deserving. But He gives it to us that we can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. And what is that talent that He gives to us? Is it faith? Is it a gift? Yes. But it's not just something that we can attribute to stewardship. It's not just something that we can tie down to a monetary value or something we do. But every gift we have is from God. Every gift that we, that we use, everything we are able to do, whether you're good at math, whether you're good at science, whether, whether you're good at listening, whether you're good at talking, whether you're good at singing or good at art, whether you're a handyman or a handy woman, those are gifts from God. And He has uniquely and wonderfully blessed each of us differently. And as our Master, He uses those gifts. He works through those gifts. He works through those gifts to help others, to care for others. Because we are not the only ones, those who are in His church. We are not the only ones who are in need. But there is a world full of people who right now, they are outside. And as they look forward, they may not realize that the day of the Lord is coming quickly. They may not realize how scary it will be when you don't know the Master. But when you don't know the Master, there will be wailing. There will be fear. There will be tears and anguish that will not end. And sometimes we think that someone else will do it. Someone else will go and make sure that they hear. But God has called us. He has called us to be the ones to go. He has called us to be the ones to take the gifts He's given and share them with others. It might be something small, but it might be something large because you don't know how the Spirit can work through you. You don't know how the Master can use the talent that He has blessed you with. So as you think about the weeks, the months ahead of you, we're entering into the holiday season. We're getting ready for some of the most joyous times of the year. And I want you to look at those times as we look forward and see if there are ways that God is using you, ways that God is leading you to share and to care for others so we may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And as Paul said in Thessalonians, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or we are asleep, we might live with him. And isn't that the goal of our loving master? Our misunderstood master. To bring all people to know him. That we might live with him now and in eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have come, that you have given your life so brutally that you have borne our sins because we could not bear our own sins. We could not go to the cross, but you could. You could go for us. You could give your life for us. We thank you because we know that gift is beyond any number that we can count. We know that that gift is beyond comparison. We thank you because we know that that gift guarantees for us eternal life. Stir up our hearts, Lord, that we may not be content to just keep the gift, but that we may go forth and share it. That we may go forth and carry it to the very ends of the earth. Christ Jesus, we pray this in your holy name. Amen.